from the first moment I met you, your arrogance and conceit, your selfish disdain for the feelings of others made me realise that you were the last man in the world I could ever be prevailed upon to marry. Forgive me, madam, for taking up so much of your time. Go on! You were supposed to kiss her! The only thing Darcy ever did wrong. What's up, my friend? Abby here, and welcome to Science of Story, where we come together to uncover the secret ingredients behind your favorite stories and learn how to use these ingredients to make our own writing unforgettable. If you know me at all, you know that I am kind of obsessed with Pride and Prejudice. I've used this story as an example in multiple videos and I've had a ton of requests to do a case study just on Pride and Prejudice. What makes this story so good? Was Jane Austen just like an incredible writer and nobody will ever be able to match her genius? Yes and no. I firmly believe that if you look closely at your favorite stories and you study the science behind them, you will find patterns, proven, repeatable storytelling tactics that you can use for your own writing. So in this video, we are breaking down Pride and Prejudice and challenging Jane Austen's famous story with the biggest questions. What makes Elizabeth Bennet a strong female character? What makes this whole story so satisfying and unforgettable? Why does everyone love Mr. Darcy? There's a scientific explanation behind that. <laughs> I kid you not. And that's what we're breaking down in today's video. So pretty much from the very beginning of the story, you can see that Lizzie's character is different from other girls. Actually, her sisters are kind of the model of the average girl in this time period, in Regency era, when Pride and Prejudice is taking place. Actually, Jane is a perfect example of the model average girl in Regency era. I talked about this in a separate video, actually, about side characters. I used Jane Bennett as an example, and she's a great example of a character whose goal is very quite average for the time period. Jane is on a mission to find true love, obviously, but Lizzie is looking for something more. She will not lower her standards. She has definitely a strong character, but the thing I find the most interesting about her character is that it's very likable. She's a very likable character from the very beginning because you see that she has weaknesses and she has internal conflict. It's not just, I'm this tough girl who doesn't need anybody or anything. She does have the desire to find true love. That is also her desire, but she is very convicted about what true love means to her. So she will definitely not be settling for less and you know that from the very beginning. One of these days, Lizzie, someone will catch your eye and then you'll have to watch your tone. And here he comes. Mr. Darcy. <gasps> it's miserable, poor sir. Miserable he may be, but poor he most certainly is not. Tell me. 10,000 a year, and he owns half of Derbyshire. The miserable half. He's about the best butcher in the county. Did I have a feeling? Oh my god, get it off, get it off! <laughs> Mrs. Bennett is just like one track mind. We have to introduce our daughters to this guy. Which also reveals her goal. So everybody has a goal. Right from the beginning, you can see that everybody has a goal. Even the side characters, even Mrs. Bennett and all her annoyingness, her goal is to see her daughters happily married. Darcy's goal is to just get out of this party. <laughs> I've never seen so many pretty girls in my life. You are dancing with the only handsome girl in the room. She is the most beautiful creature. Here comes the inciting incident. <laughs> Her sister Elizabeth is very agreeable. Fairly tolerable, I dare say. Not handsome enough to tempt me. Ouch. 
much. You'd better return to your partner and enjoy her smiles. You're wasting your time with me. Count your blessings, Lizzie. If he liked you, you'd have to talk to him. Precisely. <laughs> As it is, I wouldn't dance with him for all of Derbyshire, let alone the miserable half. <laughs> <laughs> but she would. And that's actually the inciting incident. Like, believe it or not, your inciting incident can literally be that small. It doesn't have to be this big, incredible call to adventure. It can be as simple as an overheard insult, which sparks the conflict that's going to set up the entire story okay the entire story is basically going to be the relationship between darcy and elizabeth and so we're starting from a place of both characters are actually prideful <laughs> and prejudiced they have prejudices towards each other and judgments already made about the other that is just going to set up all the obstacles for the rest of the story so what do you recommend to encourage affection dancing even if one's partner is barely tolerable Take that. <laughs> so Darcy thinks that Elizabeth's family and pretty much this entire party is very lacking in propriety. <laughs> and he's just, he's pompous. He's proud and pompous and standoffish. And Elizabeth does not like that from the very beginning. And of course she must improve her mind by extensive reading. I'm no longer surprised at your knowing only six accomplished women. I rather want to know you're knowing any. So again, we have reminders that Elizabeth is not your average girl. She is way ahead of her time. And Darcy kind of makes fun of her because of it, which is not a good move. <laughs> You're too proud, Mr. Darcy. And would you consider pride a fault or a virtue? That I couldn't say. Because we're doing our best to find a fault in you. Maybe it's that I find it hard to forgive the follies and vices of others or their offenses against me. My good opinion once lost is lost forever. So now we have a little bit more of a look into Darcy's actual character, which is not necessarily as pompous and proud as Elizabeth first assumed that he was. You have characters who are making mistakes. You have characters who have flaws, okay? Remember that a flaw is a misbelief. So both characters, all the characters actually, have their own misbeliefs, their own flaws that they're dealing with and working through. Oh, for heaven's sake, are we to receive every Bennet in the country? <laughs> Side note, I absolutely love how this scene is shot, how all the Bennett sisters and their mother are sitting on one couch and then Elizabeth is sitting on the other couch. Like she's so set apart from them. She's like so different from them all. There's an interesting dichotomy there because she obviously loves her family, loves her sisters, cares more about her sisters than anyone, but they also kind of drive her crazy. Mr. Collins is the sort of man who makes you despair of the entire sex. Yours, I believe. Enter Mr. Wickham, who is actually a jerk, but Lizzie is so ready to believe everything that Wickham says just because he is so opposite Darcy. He is this smooth, suave, charismatic guy that Elizabeth immediately likes because how could you not? We grew up together, Darcy and I. His father treated me like a second son, loved me like a son. He knew I had my heart set on joining the church. But Darcy ignored his wishes and gave the living to another man. But why? Jealousy. She thinks she has such great judgment, but this dude is just lying to her face and she's believing every word because of her prejudice towards Darcy. That's literally it. Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners. He is sure of making friends. Whether he's capable of retaining them is less certain. He's been so unfortunate as to lose your friendship. And I dare say that is an irreversible event. It is. Why do you ask such a question? To make out your character, Mr. Darcy. And what have you discovered? Very little. I hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly. One of the things that Pride and Prejudice does so incredibly well is build up the romantic development between the two characters. Like, this is how you do slow burn, okay? Especially if you're doing hate to love romance. We're not quite at the midpoint. We're like one third into it and we have some little bit of accidental romantic tension going on, which is a must have, by the way. So there's like an interesting combination of things going on at this, in this particular scene at this ball, where we have Elizabeth's family 
basically embarrassing her left and right. And this is super relevant because of Jane's story. So alongside this main plot, we have Jane's subplot and Darcy is going to play a major role in ruining his chances with Elizabeth. <laughs> because of what happens next. So kind of off screen, Darcy convinces Bingley to leave Netherfield, go to London, get out of town, go to the city, and get away from Jane because their whole family is a joke and you should not marry that girl. It's just, it's gonna be bad. That's Darcy's advice, Bingley follows it. Elizabeth doesn't know about any of this yet, but she's gonna be pretty mad when she learns about it. Even though it follows Elizabeth, you're watching Darcy's story at the same time running parallel with Elizabeth's. Even though you don't follow him as much, you can still see his internal conflict. And it's, it's really great, actually kind of funny internal conflict because he advises his best friend, okay, don't marry Jane because her family is unsuitable you shouldn't marry her. But at the same time, I'm falling in love with her sister who coincidentally hates me. Kind of a catch-22 situation. This is a charming house. I believe my aunt did a great deal to it when Mr. Collins first arrived. I believe so. Honestly, I love the writing and the acting and the characterization in this film. I think it's so excellent. I do love the 95 version of Pride and Prejudice and I love Colin Firth as Mr. Darcy, but I also love Matthew McFadden as Mr. Darcy because they're both like slightly different characterizations of Darcy, where in the 95 Prime Prejudice, Darcy is more of a pompous ass who's just actually a jerk. <laughs> and in this version, he's more of an antisocial introvert who just like literally cannot words. Both are so great. I love both. However, I will say that the 2005 version is just so cinematic and beautiful that I could just watch it forever, literally for the cinematography alone. Okay, here's here's the big moment. The Everything's about to go down. He recently came to the rescue of one of his friends just in time. What happened? He saved the man from an imprudent marriage. Who was the man? <coughs> his closest friend, Charles Bingley. What? <gasps> Miss Elizabeth, I have struggled in vain and I can bear it no longer. I have fought against my better judgment, my family's expectation, the inferiority of your birth, my rank and circumstance, all these things, and I'm willing to put them aside and ask you to end my agony. I don't understand. I love you. Plot twist. Most ardently. Please do me the honor of accepting my hand. I appreciate the struggle you have been through and I am very sorry to have caused you pain. Except I'm not. Believe me, it was unconsciously done. Is this your reply? Yes, sir. Are you... Are you laughing at me? No. Are you rejecting me? I'm sure that the feelings which, as you've told me, have hindered your regard will help you in overcoming it. It's just for historical context, this is like unheard of. First of all, it was like kind of unheard of for, for Elizabeth to refuse Mr. Collins because he was gonna inherit their house and he's the heir and it's like, oh, why not? What other thing is involved? Well, love is involved, true love is involved and I want to be in love with the man that I marry. That alone is like, you can't, you don't necessarily have that choice back then. In this time period, if you were a young woman who didn't have fortune and didn't have rank, then you are looking to marry a man who can take care of you, basically. So you're looking for a man who has fortune and rank. Darcy has both. And for her to be like, uh, you are a jerk and I will not marry you. You did my sister wrong. I'm gonna roast you. Could you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your circumstances? And those are the words of a gentleman. From the first moment I met you, your arrogance and conceit, your selfish disdain for the feelings of others made me realize that you were the last man in the world I could ever be prevailed upon to marry. Forgive me, madam, for taking up so much of your time. Come on, you were supposed to kiss her. The only thing Darcy ever did wrong. So really only after the proposal scene do we see that Elizabeth is in turmoil and inner conflict, dealing with her inner conflict because she knows there is truth to what Darcy said. Lydia, what's the matter? I'm just as much right as Lydia. Well, if I could but go to Brighton. I'm also because I'm Let's two years older. Lydia's been invited to go to Brighton with the force. Well, the sea bathing would set me up very nicely. I should dine with the officers every night. Please, Papa, don't let her go. And like even here, Elizabeth is trying to like save her 
sisters from disgrace because she knows what Lydia is like and she knows what her family is like and she's like come on come on dad we can't let this happen this is ridiculous this is gonna make things even worse and it's gonna prove Mr. Darcy right that my family is not suitable <laughs> So then Elizabeth goes with her aunt and uncle to the countryside in Kent, which happens to be nearby Mr. Darcy's house. She's like, oh no, we can't go there. I'd rather not. He's so, he's so... So what? He's so rich. By heavens, this is a snob you are. And then she sees it and she's like, why did I say no? <laughs> How <laughs> stupid am I? I wouldn't even have to like see him. This house is so big. He could have just been like some other place in the house. I wouldn't even have to see him. I could have had this house. And half of Derbyshire. The miserable half, but whatever. She's like, I wouldn't be too miserable in this house. Miss Elizabeth. I'm so sorry to intrude. They said that the house was open for visitors. I had, I had no idea. So she's feeling like a little bit awkward that she was caught in his house. And then she's also like, you know, I'm starting to think maybe I made a mistake saying no to you and I I understand now about Mr. Wickham. Maybe you weren't such a jerk. It's just more of that beautiful accidental romantic chemistry. That's one of the mistakes I see a lot of writers do with hate to love romance especially is that suddenly we have the characters hating each other to they love each other and they have no real reason for the hate or any real reason for the love. It's just like, well, they need to do this so let's just have them you know, hate each other and then love each other. And it feels so unrealistic. You have to have the slow burn. You have to have the different stages. But then, just when she thinks she might have another chance at happiness, disaster strikes. And she learns that her youngest sister, Lydia, ran away with the dastardly Mr. Wickham. Okay, so if Darcy had problems with her family before, <laughs> those problems that he had before are like nothing compared to the problems he would have now. Because technically, in that time period, you would be ruined. If your sister ran off and did that, your whole family would be ruined. No guy's gonna touch you with a 10 foot pole. So this, this disaster is kind of twofold. On the surface, it looks like just Elizabeth is upset that her sister ran off and did this. She's worried for her sister, obviously, and worried for all of her family because everyone is impacted by this. But there's also that deeper layer of it's like just confirmed. What Darcy said in the rain during the proposal is confirmed that her family is unsuitable. And when Darcy walks away, she's like, that's it, that's, it's over. That's never gonna happen again, never gonna have that chance again. Maybe we could have been something, but not anymore. That's what really brings her to the dark moment. Okay, we always talk about the dark moment. This is like the ultimate dark moment for Elizabeth's story. But it is not the end. It's not over yet. It's in uncle's writing. Because that's when a letter shows up telling the Bennets that Wickham is actually gonna marry Lydia for a certain amount of money that their uncle was able to give Wickham to make this deal go through. They will be if, if father will settle 100 pounds a year on her. That is Wickham's condition. 100 pounds? He will agree to this, father. Yes, I'll agree. God knows how much your uncle must have made on that wretched man. What do you mean, father? No man in his senses would marry Lydia under so slight a temptation as a hundred a year. And then this is when the truth comes out. This is like the beginning of Elizabeth's aha moment. Don't you? Mr. Darcy. Oh, I forgot. But I shouldn't have said a word. Mr. Darcy was at your wedding. He was the one that discovered us. He paid for the wedding. Wickham's commission. Everything. But don't tell anyone he told me not to tell. Mr. Darcy. Stop it, Lizzie. Mr. Darcy's not half as high mighty as he is sometimes. And so this is the beginning of her aha moment when she starts to realize that, oh wait, maybe Darcy's actually not as bad as I thought he was. Like, I thought this was over. I thought he's like, oh my God, your family is even worse than I thought. <laughs> I'm out of here. But he actually secretly went, found Lydia, found Wickham and was like, hey, I will pay you to marry her and save the Bennets from disgrace. And Elizabeth is like, whoa, when did he become like such a cool person? Because that is not what I thought. Character transformation, am I right? And I think that's another thing that makes Elizabeth a strong female character that's likable is that she doesn't hold on to 
her prejudices. At this point in the story, we start to see that she is realizing the truth. I'm sorry, though, that he came with Mr. Darcy. Don't say that. Why ever not? Jane. I've been so blind. She's starting to see what Darcy is really like. His true character is being revealed because he does love Elizabeth and he's trying to prove his love for her. And one of the ways that he proves his love for Elizabeth is by helping Jane and Bingley get back together and undoing the mess that he made. I made a video a long time ago about strong female characters and one of the things that really bothers me about the typical strong female character is that she's, yeah, she's stubborn, but she's like, too stubborn, you know, the, the annoying stereotyped strong female character who will not change her mind and will not re relent and she is like always right. She's not willing to admit that she's wrong. She doesn't have weaknesses, she doesn't have flaws. That's this stereotype that I hate <laughs> that the strong female character has become because good strong female characters have flaws, they have weaknesses, they have misbeliefs, they have internal conflict and fears and they're willing to change their minds, okay? So Elizabeth is willing to change her mind. She starts to see the truth. She starts to realize, wow, okay, I was actually wrong about Darcy. He's willing to prove his love for me because he actually does love me. And maybe he is actually a man of integrity. Maybe he's courageous and kind and good. And I suspect for Jane also, it is I who should be making amends. You must know. Surely you must know. It was all for you. That's it right there. <laughs> character transformation. And that is what makes Darcy a lovable character. You have bewitched me, body and soul. And I love and love and love you. I never wish to be parted from you from this day on. And the reason that matters so much, the reason that means so much is because of everything that happened before. Well then. Your hands are cold. Like I always, always talk about on this channel, a satisfying story is a story where the characters transform as a result of their journey. And that truth that they learn always goes back to the misbelief that they had at the beginning of the story. What did they mistakenly believe about the world, about themselves, about each other? And how have they transformed as a result of their journey? You can look at the protagonist at the beginning versus the protagonist at the end and see that transformation so clearly, but it is everything in between that makes us remember it, that holds our attention and makes us fall in love with it. So that is the secret science behind why everyone loves Pride and Prejudice. Smash that like button if you liked this video and be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already because I post writing videos and publishing videos every single Wednesday and I would love to have you here in the community. Also, be sure to check out my Patreon because that's where we go beyond videos and take storytelling to the next level. The Patreon community is not only the best way to support what I'm doing here on YouTube, but it's also the only way to connect one-on-one -on -one with me and get better guidance on your story. So go to patreon.com com slash Abby Emmons and check out all the awesome extra content I have over there for you. Until next week, my friend, rock on. It's ridiculous. I can like pause this movie at any point and it looks like a painting. It's like, you're actually kind of cute and your house is really great. <laughs> can I, does that proposal still stand? <laughs> it's like, you bet it does, honey, please.